Do you know if uh, Katarina is joining? Um, I'm not completely sure. She asked me to join so that okay. we at least had someone from Wageningen represented. <laughs> that's that's a sign that she may not join. Yes, I, I, I suspect that, yes. <clears throat> okay, but so we have uh, two minutes. Maybe let's give it one quick minute. We are, what, 19 now. Generally, we reach about close to 30, and I would really like to push more towards 50. But maybe we can start with a quick introduction. Um, welcome, everybody, to Delta Talks number... 14, I think. Um, as everybody knows, a very um, successful uh, yet informal and interesting uh, monthly webinar that we organize um, through the Asian Mega Deltas Initiative of the CJR and Wageningen University and Research. Um, and the topic is always around food, land, and uh, water systems in delta areas, mostly in the Ganges and the Mekong. Um, and today we have, so as always, we have a 20 to 30 minute uh, presentation, I think rather towards 20, and then um, half an hour, good half an hour discussion. So we'll do it the same way today. Uh, we have two speakers today <clears throat> from IMI, the International Water Management Institute, Dr. Deepaka Sena and Dr. Mahesh Jampani. Um, the topic today is harnessing local scale hydrological insights for enhanced water and salinity management in Asian mega deltas. Um, I'm not sure if you both will speak or only one. Can you let us yeah. know? Actually, we we are two speakers. Uh, two speakers. I'll, I'll be speaking first, followed by Mohis. Wonderful. Then uh, I guess so. Vincent, would you like to say any a few words from Wageningen? Um, well, welcome. <laughs> and and uh, I've not been able to um, attend many uh, Delta talk yet. Um, but I'm 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 very curious um, how 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 it works. You will and maybe I, I will join to make sure that you will um, reach the fifty uh, in in the future. <laughs> please please do that, and you will see it's uh, a very informal and very still very informative uh, webinar. <clears throat> so with that, we're five minutes past uh, our time. So I'll hand over to Deepaka to start the presentation, please. Can I have... Uh, uh, if you can hear me. Any... We can hear you. Do you have slides? Yeah, yeah. I'm just sharing Good. that. Uh, well, very good afternoon from India. Uh, as already been introduced, I'm Deepak Ranjan Sena, a researcher hydrology and water resources management in IMI India office. And I'll be spearheading this talk on harnessing local scale hydrological insights for enhanced water and salinity management in Asian Mega Delta. Just to set the context, uh, I would like to say that uh, IMI, as far as this uh, study is concerned, IMI has been taken to the AMD Ford uh, somewhere around uh, last of, I mean, end of 2023, and the work that has been carried out for the last nine months, uh, I, I'm going to present that. And uh, it is basically, <laughs> 
the work which was uh, planned after uh, several consultations with the stakeholders and the motivation that has been built upon with uh, the PNR workshop which was carried out in uh, in the month of uh, February and March. Uh, so to do with, uh, as we know that these mega deltas have uh, uh, in Asian, uh, in the context of Asian mega deltas, we have uh, this Mekong mega delta and uh, the Ganga, Brahmaputra and Meghna delta in Bangladesh and India. Uh, there are several key hydrological issues in the mega deltas as uh, in the perspective of water management, salinity management and social issues. Often in from the perspective of water management, inconsistent water availability, which uh, uh, is in the form of droughts and floods, and basically poor drainage leading to water logging because most of the mega deltas, uh, if you look at the lands are low lying and uh, being have got proximity to the sea, have got uh, the effect of the tidal actions because of which uh, the salt water intrusion is the most uh, biggest challenge from the perspective of salinity management and basically the management uh, uh, generally lack precise data on salinity levels and water flows and over everything social issues are also the the problem in which the first livelihood options of the community level is a major challenge in which uh, irresponsible uh, water management uh, tactics probably had uh, a lot of uh, concerns for for those holders uh, especially from the polders point of view there are several dam breaching that probably had uh, a lot of uh, its toll on the the agricultural land so Going into the context of Bangladesh, which is basically the focus of this particular talk, uh, in which uh, the salinity management is important because it was uh, a danger to food and water. From the perspective of drinking water, which is uh, salt water, which may lead to heart disease, diarrhea and abdominal pain, and has got uh, major factors related to climate migrations uh, because of the salt water encroachment. And of course, uh, with uh, not managed properly, with uh, long term problems of uh, salinity has got uh, its toll on the growth of uh, plants because it is impossible to grow anything in the soil which is have got a higher level of salinity. In the context of uh, Bangladesh, uh, which uh, have got uh, 710 kilometers of the coastal line with the three major river systems. The coastal zone, zone makes up to 32% of the country, which hosts around 35 million of people. So uh, since uh, the polders are uh, of uh, focus to this particular, uh, the, I would like to define polders. It is because it's basically a man-made low-lying area protected by embankment and during monsoon season water from the river enters through sluice gates which is being located in embankments at uh, uh, some space with some spaces with some spacing but uh, it takes water during low salinity level but as monsoon subsides the river salinity increases the inlets are closed to prevent salt water intrusion this uh, coastal polder embankment project was carried out in 1960s uh, by the World Bank project, but uh, port independence of Bangladesh in 1980s, because of uh, the fast livelihood conditions, uh, government allowed this water, uh, saline water to be taken into the polder for stream farming, which uh, has in long term has uh, created problem for these uh, older lands in terms of increased salinity. So uh, such folders are around 139, including 49 of them are sea facing, covering around 1.2 million hectares. So this is uh, uh, the map of the polders. I mean, uh, in, in, in the Ganges, Brahmaputra and, uh, and Meghna Delta, of which uh, the focal, uh, area of our study is in Kulna, which is a small polder for pilot study. 
that is polder 34 by 2 part, which is being surrounded by a, two rivers. One is Kajibacha, another is Pasu River, Kajibacha on the west and Pasu on the east. Uh, on the southern part, uh, because of the tidal action, the water enters into these, this river and the, the salinity transition that uh, takes place from higher on the southern side towards the northern side. But during monsoon season, when runoff takes place, we find this uh, uh, that the salinity level reduces, and this is the favorable time for uh, during which the farmer can take water through those fish gates, which looks like this on, on this particular side slide. And there are several sluice gates, around 29 of, of them are located all around these folders. So the motivation that I have already mentioned have come from several consultations. So the one that has started with the PNR workshop that has taken place during February and March of 2024. Followed by field consultations we had during the 2nd of March and in the 3rd March we had a stakeholder consultation meeting to find out what are those issues which is relevant for salinity management with the fun functionaries of uh, BWDB's uh, Groundwater Board and several other uh, organizations like uh, um, Institute of Water Ma Modeling in Bangladesh, so who are eventually our partners in this particular study, along with IRI, Dr. Monranjan Mandal, who has initiated uh, this study in the past and has uh, asked us to carry out uh, modeling to, to give a real-time salinity forecasting. So why salinity forecasting? This, these are the some of the major problems which uh, basically uh, requires this salinity, salinity forecasting at the forefront of our studies. Because so far the floor for, for forecasting received more focus and salinity has more immediate impact on crops than floods. And then salinity impacts agricultural productivity for most of the crops. And if not managed properly, the long-term soil degradation and crop losses are also a problem. So forecasting provides a lead time for agricultural decision making. As we know that the moment uh, we have got a favorable window uh, of uh, threshold uh, water, which is below the threshold salinity for, for the agricultural operations, the agricultural irrigations. Uh, so if you can identify those uh, windows uh, in uh, uh, advance, probably we can be able to give them a kind of advisory to start their agricultural operations uh, and give a pinpoint time window that they can take the irrigation from by opening the sluice gates at the different locations. So this forecasting will provide this lead time for their agricultural decision making. And as we are planning for a real time forecast in the future, probably it will optimize the planting, irrigation, and crop selections. For that, we will be employing this AIML modeling, which uh, is uh, a very simple, uh, which can simply be deployed uh, with better prediction accuracy than uh, more complicated process based models. And if the salinity management can be done, then it's a long term, it, it will lead to long term sustainability and food security. So with this, the objectives that has been put in a particular study, which has been carried for the last nine months, to create an AI ML driven salinity forecasting system for the polder number 34 by 2P, which is uh, in near in Kulna district, and the Ganges Delta, enabling farmers to make informed decisions regarding the commencement of their agricultural seasons each year. For that, the AI ML framework for the salinity forecasting that we have employed have to have some covariates to be able to forecast river salinity accurately. For that, we have got a reference river discharge, uh, which is located in the Harjins Bridge, which will be utilized, and some of the river discharge, uh, which is already being simulated by our partner in Institute of Water Modeling river salinity between 2011 to 2022, and also they have the information related river water level. These will be used as the covariate along with the reference river discharge and put in some of the candidate models of the AI ML to be able to 
forecast reverse salinity at least one month in advance so that we can give an advisory to the farmers to initiate their agricultural cropping season. So to understand exactly what we are going to do, this is just a, a, a figure which shows the salinity in orange color and the green is the river level. The moment we have, uh, as we see that uh, as uh, during monsoon season, the salinity comes down drastically below zero level. So the moment we have got a threshold level of salinity, then we can have a favorable window available for, uh, for that particular specific gate. Uh, this is for uh, 2000. Uh, Simulated for 2018 to 2020, the specific window that is available is 15th July to 31st of December, during which the farmer can safely take this water, saline uh, the water, which is good for irrigations. So for that, we need to forecast all these three parameters like river discharge at each uh, sluice gate, river level, as well as salinity. So the, the reference level will help us to get all those informations with some pre-simulated information by our partners, Institute of Water Modeling, which is available from 2011 to 2022. So the moment the sluice elevation is known, then probably we will have the gravity-based uh, water intake into the canals. And for that, we need to predict at least a month before this advisory is to be created a month before to help farmers to take up the agricultural operations. So using these candidate models, we found that LSTM, which is a multivariate as well as univariate model, uh, which worked very well for us. Some examples that I just wanted to give you for this site, the observed salinity and the forecasted salinity worked well from 2020 to 2022 so far. The moment we have got more information available beyond 2022, probably we'll be able to do employ it under the pilot scale. The second one is for the Swiss gate DS2. Here also the R square, all statistical parameters are excellent with our square root of 0.99 and NSC 0.99. So since the LSTM is a, an advanced version of the RNN, that is recurrent neural network system, uh, it has got uh, a good performance in terms of predicting uh, at a precision level, you can um, compare to the clinical precision. Uh, this is for ID14 sluice gate. Like this, the simulation has been made for all 29 pools and with this uh, we'll be having this information available one month before with a start and end date for for each one of these sluice gates uh, that we can see from 1 to 8 from this side 8 to 20 from this side and 20 to 29 from these sides so uh, as we move from north to south uh, the start date will start increasing from there is around 15 days delay between north and south so that the thing uh, can be managed at least uh, all the farmers would, would get a advisory which would they help them to start their agriculture operations in a, a hierarchical manner from north to south as, as they move from um, the uh, when the monsoon season starts uh, with this, uh, we had uh, several uh, field uh, Can I just uh, uh, one quick interruption? Yeah. I mean, you have been speaking for 15 minutes. If my yeah, I have, I have done, speak... I have done. This, this is my last right. slide. This is my Thank last you. slide. This is field snapshots for the water quality data measurement and characterization of the sluice gates that we have done. We had uh, a, a thorough recognition of the area with all the sluice gates and the polder areas and the related problems and my next speaker will talk in details about it 
and the way forward that we plan for 2025 and further is just to piloting the P34 to a tuna forecasting for 2024 to 2025 uh, as we are looking for data and some reason we couldn't get the data from the IWM and uh, we are uh, lightening with uh, the state uh, I mean the government of Bangladesh and BWDB to help us getting some information of the reference stations. Then the second one to extend the model deployment to other folders the moment that this particular model is ready. And the third one is exploring possibility to, to integrate the forecasting system to existing advisory infrastructures like maybe possibility of developing a forecasting dashboard to provide real time information dissemination. So that's uh, that is uh, what I just uh, uh, in my presentation. I would like to pass the baton to my next uh, speaker, Dr. Mahesh Jampani. Thank you for your attention. If in case you have some questions, you can ask me right now. Otherwise, we can wait for the entire. Uh, I think we should. I think we should uh, hear the second uh, presentation okay. first, and then thank you. Thank uh, you go into questions and answers. Thank you, Mahesh. Please. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Ole. Thanks, uh, Synergy. Uh, so to my presentation is, is to connect the dots actually to integrated understanding. Hope you can see the full screen. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the integrated understanding actually how both of the salinity forecasting system and different parts of the modeling uh, we are doing. So all of it is connecting it together. So where we are working principally, principally working in the Mekong Delta and the Ganges Delta. Ganges Delta, both of the scale is locally and some of them regional assessments also as I go forward, I will explain more. So in general, initially we started with the social hydrological review, which uh, to understand how the water system and the human subsystems in a social hydrological system connected together, because uh, when we look at the social hydrological scale of these deltas, but there are not many studies understanding the social implications or economic implications on the behavior of the hydro hydrology into the whole systemic level. So that's why we started actually uh, doing a broader literature review as we expected actually, uh, this is a social hydrological perspective. And as we go forward, as we expected, uh, Airavati Delta principally have less uh, research case studies and also less papers. And the Ganges and Mekong has uh, enormous amount of papers which uh, explain different aspects of the hydrology connection to the social dynamics in the system. So that's where we uh, are preparing this final draft soon enough uh, to submit to understand the integrated approaches, how intertwining of the sociological system and also the commonalities between these th three systems, three data systems. And going into deep, actually, uh, ba ba background understanding of the social hydrological system, uh, we want to connect the sanity forecasting modeling system with this broader integrated modeling approach to uh, understand and evaluate the water availability and sanity, uh, sanity conditions with respect to seasonal dynamics. And also how uh, once we understand the business as usual scenario, scenario and we uh, try to understand the scenario analysis of tidal conditions and water consumption patterns, irrigation practices in the polder, and then further to that, establish relatively plausible and extreme scenarios, evaluating water and salinity dynamics and how it will go forward with respect to severe or moderate anthropogenic impacts and climate risks as well. And at the end of it, we want to uh, develop the efficient water management strategies uh, using the different modeling scenarios. And so to going forward, we uh, went to build out, to develop the models. We uh, collected some field samples of water and uh, soil samples, specifically water. We did seven groundwater and seven surface water for the polder. Uh, 34 by 2p and this we plan to do for one hydrological year. So uh, this is to pre-monsoon, post-monsoon and during the monsoon where we collect the samples and also the uh, soil samples specifically on pre-monsoon and the post-monsoon uh, before the crop starts and uh, after the crop ended we want to do the soil sal salinity analysis as well and connecting to this how the social hydrology uh, is there within the polder. So we did a uh, detailed social hydrological survey uh, with uh, all the WMGs included within the polder. So with uh, all the social hydrological, social hydrological data, we are connecting that with the water quality and hydrological modeling data. 
So to explain how the social hydrological system behavior in the older specific area. And if you look at it, this uh, this is sanity exactly before the polder area, polder 34.2p in the river, where uh, the seasonal sanity is uh, increasing over the dry season and monsoonal, it's actually dilutes it over. And if you look specifically over the uh, 2022, there is a dry season, the sanity is much lower. Uh, this is where uh, severe flooding happened and also this, uh, the flow of the river increased. So the pushback from the uh, tidal events, then that's why the sanities tend to be uh, more or less. And more into the sanity uh, perceptions within the polder itself. And there is surface water and the groundwater surface water tend to be high saline, highly saline. It's three to eight PPT. And groundwater is one to three PPT. And the drinking water, which is in the third aquifer, is generally around 0 0.7 PPT. And less less uh, uh, saline values and most of these groundwater wells we collected are irrigation wells and except one which is of the groundwater well of drinking and majority of the groundwater irrigation we found is in the upper parts of the polder where the uh, the northern area is actually the second crop irrigation is done uh, using the groundwater so i don't want to go into the schematics these are the uh, flow and transport modeling we are doing now. And we are uh, separating into three aquifers where the aquifer one shallow aquifer, which is highly saline, and the second aquifer where the farmers are tapping the groundwater for second irrigation. And third aquifer is the one uh, where they're doing the deep uh, deep well uh, uh, for drinking water, drinking water purposes, which is uh, specifically use it, using it for drinking purposes. Uh, we found no well uh, drilled into third aquifer. Uh, for irrigation purposes. And these are some initial modeling results uh, connecting the sanity forecasting system to the sanity distribution within the polder itself, how over the months and over the years, the sanity uh, distribution will change with respect to the tidal events, with respect to the seasonal fluctuations. And so briefly going into the Vietnam part where we are doing in the Mekong Delta, uh, productivity of Delta systems, uh, Crop water productivity, where we uh, develop in the high resolution crop water use data sets from satellite data. Um, so this is to uh, this is to understand the large scale irrigation systems in the Mekong Delta and how over the over the crop water use uh, will evaluate will tell us the how the Mekong Delta system will uh, is evaluating over the years. And this is some initial results. Um, Considering the time, I will just run through it. Um, if you see the 2014 to 23, there is a trade off between water use, uh, irrigation, and fisheries, especially Cambodia region. And also, uh, there are some multi stakeholder provincial platforms also for water use in the irrigation schemes. And these two uh, irrigated areas in Vietnam, uh, the Cambodia part and the Vietnam part, are developed using this crop water production maps, and this is my uh, monthly average. You can see the differences over the March, April, and also at the same time, the November and December. And the same for the Ganges Delta also be. Uh, this is currently under progress. We will be uh, finishing it up and publishing it soon, uh, where you can see the differentiation between the March and June is a uh, different level and September to December at the different level. And Going forward, the future, we are also doing the remote sensing of water quality because sanity is a bigger issue in, this, in these two deltas, and we want to understand the systemic understanding from over the years 2010 to 2023, how the sanity changed over the months. So uh, this is the test case. We are initially doing the uh, turbidity analysis for the uh, Ganges Delta. And you can see the turbidity, salinity are the similar patterns they're following. Uh, whenever the water is highly saline, it's of course turbid. So this data is very useful to understand how uh, fluctuations happening over the delta X, delta X scale. And we plan to do it going forward the next year and the next year also uh, for further work, we want to do the more uh, robust can, uh, 
scale up the salinity analysis and do the robust forecasting system in the and also do an integrated assessment of the water and salinity beyond Kulna Polda, what we are doing now. And also the we want to develop the water management options. As I mentioned earlier, all this integrated modeling to understand the management options, uh, develop the management strategies. And also in the Mekong Delta, we have planned to do the crop water use data set at the irrigation scheme level. And also the how these competing water users in provincial stakeholder platforms, how they can use these data sets. And also to crop produce productivity gaps, uh, hotspot maps in the irrigated in these both irrigated systems. So this this work is actually uh, cumulative effort of the several of colleagues here, and you can see uh, several of from EMI, IRI, and also we have in in country partners IWM Bangladesh and also Dragon Mekong Institute in Kanto. So this brief run through uh, a lot of information in just the. Uh, 10 minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mahesh and uh, also Deepaka. Uh, I saw there were a lot of uh, comments already or a conversation happening in the chat. Um, can someone maybe give us a brief summary that everybody is updated what has been discussed there? Mike, I think you had a question. And received responses. Yes, indeed. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, my question relates to the experience we have in the Ayawadi Delta, Myanmar, where there are a number of polders that were put in place with World Bank loans back in the late 1980s. Several of these have now failed because the sluice gates are silted up, um, mainly because of the proximity to the estuarine environment with uh, sedimentation rates of around one meter depth per dry season. In other words, the sluice gate, when it comes to the wet season and it should open up and allow excessive rain water to leave the polder, it can't because these, the, the sluice gate is stuck closed. And the invest we looked into the investment with IMI, um, Sanjiv. Uh, the silver and Mark Dubois, we looked at the possibility of dredging, but it would have been prohibitive around $10,000 or more per sluice gate. So my question was, has this been witnessed in Bangladesh? And the answer was yes. And it is, I gather from the chat, difficult to deal with this because um, any device to dredge has to be waterborne uh, and therefore it's difficult to get it up the channel and pumping with cutter pumps to to pump water and sediment out is also very expensive so that was a i guess a summary of the chat thank you over thanks and what so what's the solution from bangladesh if i can respond <clears throat> Yeah, uh, in Bangladesh also we have uh, observed several sluice gates already have been uh, uh, under sedimentation, and most of these sedimentations are coming from this uh, river discharge, which is sediment laden. So, one solution uh, during our stakeholder consultation also this particular thing has come up, and uh, we propose something like. Uh, to have a kind of a screen screen or kind of a trap for these kind of sediments to enter into these sluice gates. This will initially take care of uh, some uh, large size sediments. But the moment uh, there are some suspended sediments are there, probably the dredging those would be much easier. Mm -hmm. has, that been, has that been tried? No, actually, this has not been tried by them, but we have proposed them that if it can be done, this particular question has been come from several stakeholders uh, of our interactions with uh, those BWDP and uh, uh, other functionaries of uh, the Bangladesh. And we have proposed them some, some solutions like that. Uh, and locally also, some people are there, those who are open this gate, uh, 
by uh, fancy dreams, uh, which basically the physical taking water because of these water user associations, which are being built uh, quite long ago. Uh, probably they are not so, I mean, proactive in taking this action. Mm. So uh, these are some of the solutions we can propose uh, in, in the course of this particular study. And we have already taken into cognizance of all those problems which we have already seen in the field and are recognizing. So soon we'll be looking for some kind of a policy statements for, for, for this kind of actions to be taken in the future. OK, thanks. I mean, it seems to be a, a problem that uh, can be anticipated and, and should be, must be dealt with. Uh, and. So, I mean, if the cost is $10,000, there must be a way to keep those sluice, sluice gates operational uh, with investments either from a uh, public uh, sector or through uh, a private sector corporation, maybe. I don't know what uh, solutions are, but I think that's a very important topic to follow up on. I see many other questions in the chat and I lost a bit the overview, so maybe uh, I'll ask people to raise their hands so that we can uh, hear the question directly and answer answer them. Anybody who uh, Mike had another question, go ahead. Yes, uh, sorry. Uh, my uh, question for Mahesh, thanks and thanks for the, the presentation, which was interesting. Have you come across any examples of land set aside schemes? In other words, where there is extensive salinization and rice crops fail, and indeed all crops fail, including uh, brackish water shrimp aquaculture in the Mekong Delta. Have you seen governments setting aside land for mangrove swamps as a nature-based solution? Over. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Michael. Yeah, I'm just about to reply, but yeah. In generally, we saw in the downstream that there is a mangroves where it is protected area as ecosystem, uh, which is generally considered as NBS system also, where a lot of salinity is going through it and they are generally protected ecosystem, but uh, I'm not sure how that is uh, intertwined or interlinked with this irrigation system in the delta, because uh, those are mangroves, the separate species, and also the fish there, or the aquatic ecosystem is completely different, whereas the irrigation, they generally depend on the this river and the more upstream area. And in that areas, there is no specific NBS solutions in general. Only the government schemes to provide the uh, water to less saline, that is less saline. Oh, that doesn't answer your question <laughs> to some extent. Yes. Um, well, what I was looking for is some indication whether you've seen evidence of a government setting aside land and maybe through a compensation scheme to the farmers to to give it back to nature uh, mangrove which is a highly productive ecosystem yeah probably more so than than either shrimp aquaculture or, or rice production but it's a painful decision because you know somebody's lost their land and how are they compensated yeah i think mm -hmm. my colleague uh, uh, kati can jump in to provide more uh, details thanks Manish. um yes michael we, when when we were discussing this with the stakeholders um, um this came across uh, actually in one of the irrigation systems that we um, visited uh, there are plans to basically reduce the number of um you know cropping uh, cropping uh, crops they grow annually, right? And then slowly move towards as an as an I think five to ten years they have a plan and incentivize the farmers 
uh, such that they, they basically reduce the number of crops they grow and then some of these lands could be potentially repurposed for nature-based solutions because these irrigation systems adjoin a, a bird sanctuary within, within a small bird sanctuary within the Mekong Delta. But then these are very small areas when you compare to the entire size, entire spatial extent of the Mekong Delta. I believe that uh, it's, it's, a, it's a very small pilot that, that they're trying to, at the moment, you know, um, no, st get get it started, uh, but then they, they even that they have it as a long term plan, like over the over the course of five to ten years. But then the total amount of area they mentioned was very small compared to the the large large scale irrigation systems that exist in the Mekong Delta. Thank you. Once there is a comprehensive report ready about those pilots, please share that with us. I see uh, Feroz had uh, a number of questions, and I'm wondering, are you still with us, Feroz, so we could discuss them? It does not seem to be the case. So he was asking, does this river have tidal impact? And if that's the case, then is this the discharge from the ebb tide? I think that was related uh, to the first presentation. Also, is there a risk of overfitting? And will the sluice gate operation consider tides or will they stay open for 24 hours? So, uh, actually, I have already answered there in the chart. Uh, it is basically the data that we have uh, considered for this particular fitting. All, considers both flood as well as a tidal uh, so discharge uh, in which the effect of tide is also being considered in the process based modeling which has already been done by our partner institute of water modeling bangladesh so what we are trying to do with this kind of thing in place we are fitting this uh, uh, rnn uh, uh, that is lstm uh, aiml modeler so with that in place, uh, I, I fully agree that that may be issue of uh, overfitting, but we are looking at the, those issues uh, with the moment we have uh, the title information with us, which is not right now available from any source. Even the IWM people also fail to give that to us. But we are looking for some some sources in through which we can include that as well, so that uh, the problem of overfitting can be addressed. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Other questions? Uh, you can either write them in the chat or raise your hand. I have one more general question, um, and that is, we are always talking about socio-hydrological modeling. I saw a lot of hydrological modeling results now being presented. Can you maybe uh, explain a little bit more about this social component. Is there also some kind of um, social economic modeling involved, or how what how does this social component fit in here? Yeah, thanks, Ole. In generally, the social ideological modeling, in the sense, we got the social social information of the polder. We're explaining uh, different farmers or stakeholders. Uh, one is the stakeholders in the sense uh, we got the uh, a workshop through that we got the information from the government stakeholders where we asked a series of questions to them and they, they were answering about the, this series of questions explaining what is the hydrological system in these areas how the social uh, fabric is affected by these hydrological uh, changes and fluctuations and what the modeling scenario should be addressed and the other one is when we went to the field and collect the social economic survey i mean economics part is very less but mostly the social part and that aspect includes the how many uh, farmers are using the groundwater for irrigation how many farmers are continuously depend on the uh, canal for saline water for the rice paddy irrigation or any other crops so all these aspects are included in the model saying that the what is the groundwater abstraction with respect to the a certain farmer or a farmer group 
in the certain uh, water management group system, WMG, I think it's called. So in this specific WMG, if the water is abstracted continuously over the months in the second irrigation system, how the hydrological behavior will be changes. So those kind of scenarios we're planning to infuse into the model uh, based on this socio-economic survey. Understood. Thank you very much. Other questions to the presenters? <clears throat> I saw on one of the slides uh, a paper that's being produced uh, that's that was just mentioned, Schulze et al. And I see Paul Schulze here in the uh, uh, yeah. in the webinar. Um, maybe I can just uh, bring the spotlight to you. Do you can you let us know what's this paper going to be about and uh, what yeah what can we expect? Um, yes. Um, so we'll be basically doing comprehensive review of socio-hydrological dynamics in the three delta regions. And as mentioned on the um, paper and the slides, but just briefly mentioned by Mahesh, is that we're looking at a range of different um, papers being out there and trying to map out the both, both social and hydrological dynamics that are eminent deltas and do very small comparative um, study aspects also because the deltas are very different but also have um, several commonalities and we'll try to analyze those um, by merging social and hydrological dynamics. And how far are you in the analysis? Can you give us uh, a few preview results? We have just finished data analysis. Um, we have uh, initially identified over 9,000 papers and narrowed them down to a more palatable uh, number. And we now begin with the writing part and we look forward to have that study finished by the end of this year. Wonderful, perfect. We're excited for that. Thank you. Other questions or comments? I see Dr. Salaudin has a question. Do you want to quickly ask, ask the question? Salaudin? Go ahead, unmute yourself. Dr. Salaudin, can you unmute yourself? Uh, maybe he there's already, an, uh, He has already written the question. Is, yeah, maybe there's the an question, issue with the... The question the that whether the model... Uh, if I if I answer this, yes, uh, already. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, the question is whether the model should consider the impact that has been due to insufficient flow of Ganges water by controlling through the dam and unilateral withdrawal upstream in India. So that is what uh, we have been planning to do. That's the reason why we have kept uh, this uh, reference station, which is Hadings Bridge, uh, which basically is. Uh, the trademark, I mean, the will provide you the uh, the 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 flow that is coming from the Indian side, uh, which will help us in getting the moment we have those informations. Probably we will have altogether a different results in the moment the moment we have uh, low discharge in the Ganges from the Indian side. So, so the, obviously with the reference station being in place, uh, we can we can address uh, those issues as well. If if uh, if I answer that question correctly, uh, Dr. Uh, Salatin. He seems to have technical, technical problems, problem. but I think you answered the question. Very nicely, thank you. I would have another question uh, that takes us a bit away from uh, the presentations. 
and that is um, looking at the work that's being done in the Mekong Delta. Um, and now the big topic at the moment is, of course, the new canal that's being built in Cambodia, uh, connecting uh, Phnom Penh with uh, which I don't know which with with the ocean, uh, which basically is a new canal uh, that would potentially strongly impact uh, water further downstream in the Mekong Delta. Is there any attempt to to look what the implications would be from a hydrological modeling perspective? Is there any work that's maybe already uh, been, been undertaken uh, in that regard to understand a bit more in detail what the implications would be? Uh, thanks, Ole. I think um, I think Kati might come in because he might be more uh, information on that. Sure, Kati, uh, please. No, Ali. Uh, at the moment, Ali, uh, at the moment, our model essentially estimates the amount of water used by the crops, primarily using remote sensing data. We haven't set up an hydrological model for Mekong to look at variations in 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 river flows, right? Um, that the, the model that we currently use doesn't do that. But having said that, there are other models that are currently in um, more like in an in an um, both in a hindcast as well as a forecast mode, which was operated by, for example, by Survey Mekong, uh, which has got an hydrological component as well as then which gets extended into a drought component. And there are other organizations which runs the Mekong scale hydrological model, which could technically be repurposed or somebody must be already doing it. At least I'm not aware of it yet. Uh, so this is a news to me. So yeah, we can try to find out if some work has already been done. But having said that, that I believe that if that's the case, that's going to have serious repercussions for the uh, water availability, particularly in the Vietnamese part of the Mekong Delta. And I believe that, for example, the current crop water use estimates that we have produced from 2014 to 2023 would again serve as a, some sort of a baseline. And then we can also look at the post assessment when when the project it's completed and that there is significant diversion taking place. Thank you. Yeah, I think it would be interesting to see, can we um, can we do some forecast study now as so with maybe within the next phase uh, of our uh, work plan, is it possible to look into that issue? Because I know it's a big topic uh, in Cambodia and Vietnam and leads to quite some political tensions. Yeah, it can be definitely done. Um, uh, I, I'm sure you are, you might be aware of another piece of work that we have done. So we are building a digital twin of a river base in, yeah. in uh, Limpopo in Southern Africa as a part of a digital innovation project. Um, there we basically uh, built a uh, large scale hydrological model covering the entire basin and then trying to look at the water availability, how water availability changes uh, in terms of, for example, we have multiple forecasts running in the model, short term forecast, as well as sub seasonal forecast and then seasonal forecast, and then co connecting it to a number of applications, for example, in different river sections, whether the environmental flow requirements are satisfied, or the downstream countries are getting the water that they have been agreed as per the, you know, the agreements. Um, so we can definitely look into it if there is an interest and, and need in Mekong. I think that would be very interesting to plan for. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for thanks for letting us know. I, I'm not aware of this canal project. I can I can or I can send you some more information. Uh, yeah, please, there's please, quite please. some concern, particularly on the Vietnamese side, obviously. Okay. Sure. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Other questions? We would still have a few minutes left. There were lots of questions in the beginning in the chat, but it seems uh, that has all been answered. If there are no more questions, <clears throat> then uh, I would like to thank everybody again for attending this session and also like to highlight that next month we have 
the Delta Talks number 15. Uh, in uh, October, this will be organized by Wageningen University. And do we have a topic already, Eisen? Yeah, we already have. It's posted in our website. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. <laughs> would you, Sorry. Would, can you let us know what's the topic? If, if you can't find it right now, I'm sure it will be a very interesting topic um, with a good discussion again. Um, so you will be uh, invited. You will receive another calendar invitation with the topic in due time. Uh, and it's again in four weeks from now. Thank you all very much and see you next time. Bye bye. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.